uh, standard deviation sigma evaluated on this interval. So 1 over 2 pi sigma squared AB E minus T squared to sigma squared DT. Okay, that's the central limit theorem. Now, before I do this, I would like to uh, remind you a couple of facts on convergence in distribution. And then we'll see how to prove the, how to prove the theorem. So this is, uh, I should say here, for all. Yeah. Okay, so here is a brief reminder on convergence in distribution. So suppose Xn, capital Xn, a random variable. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, absolutely mean zero. If the mean is not zero, then you need to subtract here the integral, and you get the same result. Yeah, but the way that I stated it, it's only under the assumption that uh, the integral is zero. If the integral is not zero, subtract the integral from psi in this uh, formula. Yes, thank you. Okay, so suppose x and a random variable, not necessarily defined on the same probability space. Suppose y is another random variable, then Xn, we say that Xn converges in distribution to Y if the probability that Xn is smaller than T converges as N tends to infinity to the probability that Y is less than T for all T such that uh, theta goes to the probability of y minus theta is continuous at theta equals t. This condition here, ignore it. In our case, we are talking about the normal distribution. The, distrib the normal distribution is continuous everywhere. So Convergency distribution to the normal distribution uh, is the same as this convergence to this for all t. But in general, if the uh, distribution of y has atoms, has jumps, then you need to be careful whether this is strictly less than t or less than or equal to t. It makes a difference, and that's why you have to make this uh, additional uh, condition. Now, there is a tool, a fantastic tool, for proving uh, convergence in distribution which is Fourier analysis. And the tool is called the Levy, uh, the Levy Continuity Theorem. And it says that Xn converges in distribution to Y if and only if the Fourier transform, which in the probabilistic context is called the characteristic function of the random variables Xn, converges pointwise to the Fourier transform or the characteristic function of the limiting distribution for all T. Now, this is a very remarkable theorem in particular because there it also has quantitative versions. There are inequalities which tell you that if this characteristic function is close in a certain sense to this characteristic function, then the distribution function will be close in a certain sense to this the distribution function of the limit. If you look at the notes, you will see such, a, such an inequality. Uh, the one that appears there is, the, is called the Berry-Essen smoothing inequality. And you can use it to prove the Levy continuity theorem in the particular case of the normal distribution in such a, in such a way that you even have a, 
a rate of convergence. A rate of convergence that tells you that if this converges to this at a certain rate, then this converges to that at a certain rate. So you can look at the notes for, uh, for more information on this. But uh, what I would like to say now is that because of the Levy continuity theorem, it is possible to prove convergence in distribution by showing that the characteristic function of the Fourier transform of this sum converges to the Fourier transform of the, to the characteristic function of the normal distribution. And that is exactly what we will do. So what we will do is, uh, what we will do is we'll show that the integral of e to the i t over square root of n of psi n, okay, from now on, I'm going to call the Birkhoff sum psi n. Okay, so psi n is this Birkhoff sum, and we will show that the integral converges to the characteristic function of E i t normal distribution, and this is, it, this is e to the mi minus one half sigma squared t squared. Okay? So that's what we will do. Now, uh, there is a very beautiful and general method for doing such things using a transfer operator, which is called Nagayev's method. Nagayev's method. Nagayev's method is based on an identity which expresses this quantity in terms of the transfer operator. It's just an identity that you write down and you verify, and here it is. So let t hat t denote the operator be the operator t hat t of f is the transfer operator applied not to f but to e i t psi f. Okay? So, what you can check is so direct calculation, direct calculation show that if you iterate this operator, then the result is the transfer operator iterated n times applied to E i t psi n f. So you just calculate and you see that this happens. This is an exercise for you. And therefore, E i t psi n, the characteristic function that is of interest to us, this is the integral of E i t psi n d mu. So I can write this in a funny way. I can write this like this. Integral of the constant function 1 evaluated at t n times E i t psi n d mu, okay? And now I move the t to the n to this side with the transfer operator, and I will get this. 1 times t hat n e i t psi n times the constant function 1. So this is just the integral of this, of this function. Okay? 
So what Nagaev says is we only need to understand the behavior of this thing. Okay? You see the idea? So what we have to do is we have to understand the asymptotic behavior of the perturbed operator to the power n applied to the constant function 1. Notice again that the test function that we are using is just the constant function 1. We don't need a particularly big Banach space uh, on which to act. We just need a Banach space which contains the constant function uh, on which we have good behavior of the operator. Good behavior in our, in our case is going to be spectral gap. So let's see what spectral gap gives in this case. So we assume that we assume that T has spectral gap. By assumption, T hat is equal to lambda zero P zero plus N zero, where N is small and P is a projection and a P naught a naught is A naught, P naught is zero. Now, because T is a transfer operator of a mixing map, then we know what's lambda and what's P. So, so this means that T hat N converges to P naught by mixing. Uh, T hat N F converges to the integral of F in L1. So when you compare convergence in L, which is stronger than convergence in L1, to convergence in L1, you will immediately find that lambda has to be equal to 1 and P has to be equal to the integration. Since convergence in L implies convergence in L1, lambda 0 is 1, and P0 of F is just the constant function integral of F times 1. Okay? Now, this is, what, this is the case for the transfer operator, which is T hat, which, by the way, is also T0. Okay? If I substitute t equals zero, I get the ordinary transfer operator. What happens when you switch for small t different from zero? So if you use a spectral gap is stable under analytic perturbations, so for all z small, you look at the perturbed operator, well now not with the, not with the real parameter t, but with the complex parameter z, but that doesn't matter, that's even better, you can write it like this, it will also have spectral gap. Okay, so let's use this expansion to calculate this. Okay, 
Let's see what we get. So what is this? This is lambda t to the square n, p t over square, square root n, plus n t over square root n, ah, applied to the constant function 1, well, to the power n, applied to the constant function 1. Now, when you open the brackets, because p annihilates n and n annihilates p, all the mixed terms uh, uh, go away, cancel out, and you are left with this. Now, because p is a projection, p to the power n is p, so I don't need this thing here. Okay, so now I'm going to write it like that. Lambda n t square root n p0 plus p t square root n minus p0 plus lambda t, this is a big bracket, t square root of n minus n, n t over square root of n, everything applies applied to the constant function 1. Okay? Now let's look at this. Let's look at the terms inside the bracket. Let's start with this one. Spectral gap tells us that the spectral radius of n is always smaller than the absolute value of the eigenvalue, well, for perturbations which are small. So this means that the norm of this operator has exponential growth which is smaller than the absolute value of this number. So this is stronger than this, and this goes to zero. Goes to zero in norm. The norm of this operator goes to zero. Now what about this? Because of analytic perturbation, function, uh, perturbation theory, the eigenprojection P is analytic in Z. In particular, it's continuous in Z. If it's continuous in Z, then as n tends to infinity, this operator tends to this operator again in norm. So this also goes to zero. So what follows from all this is that, a, let me take an integral so that I work with the numbers and not with the <coughs> not with operators. So the characteristic function e i p psi n over n, this by Nagayev's trick, this is this quantity. This will be one plus little o of one times this number. Okay, I integrate. I remind you that P0 is the, op the integration operator. Okay, so this is a con. P0 applied to one is the constant number one. And here you have something which in the norm of L goes to zero. The norm of L is stronger than the L1 norm. So in L1 norm it goes to zero. So the integral goes to zero. Okay, and the same, the same with here. So this is what we get. So now you see that in order to understand the uh, asymptotic behavior of the characteristic function, what you have to do is understand this number. Now, lambda z 
is an eigenvalue of a perturbed operator. Lambda z is also analytic in z. So what we are going to do is we are going to use the analyticity of lambda z to write a Taylor expansion. Degree 2 is enough. Plug it into this power, and then, we'll, then this will be enough to find the limit. Okay? So what we will do is the following. by analytic perturbation theory, lambda z is analytic at zero, or uh, holomorphic at zero. So we'll show, a, a little bit later, so, I mean, but, but today, we'll show that the derivative of lambda at zero is zero, and the derivative of lambda, the second derivative of lambda is negative, is uh, minus sigma square for some sigma non-zero. And then, we'll write Uh, lambda t is 1, this is lambda 0. Lambda 0 that is equal to 1, we already know. So this is 1. The linear term di is not there. 1 half sigma squared t squared plus little o of well, big O of t cubed. So once we have this, this gives lambda n t over square root of n. This is 1 minus 1, o one over uh, 2 sigma squared t squared over n plus big O t cubed n 3 halves to the power n. Okay? So it's now an cal uh, uh, exercise in calculus to see that this converges to e to the minus one half sigma, sigma squared t squared. If you want to do it, take log and see what the log, what the log of the, this expression tends to. Log of this expression tends to n minus the log of this thing. The log of one minus a small number is the small number. So you get n times a log of, uh, uh, sorry, n times one half sigma squared t squared over n, so then it's cancelled out and you get uh, the log of this expression, okay? So really what we have to do is we have to expand the eigenvalue. And then we are done. So let's expand the eigenvalue. Let's find the derivatives of the eigenvalue. By the way, Notice that uh, because we have that the error term here is, uh, is, is explicit, we can also write down the rate of convergence in this limit. And then by the quantitative versions of the Levy continuity theorem, in, uh, which the Berry SN estimates, we can get the rate of convergence in the central limit theorem. So if you want to see these quantitative estimates, again, I invite you to look at the notes. Okay, so now let's find the derivatives of lambda. Okay, so first, uh, let's start with the derivatives of the perturbation operator. So here is an exercise. So write uh, mg, call this the operator mg of f is gf. So the exercise is 
that this is a bounded operator with norm g. I you know what. It is equal to the norm, but the, we don't need it. And second is that if you take tz and differentiate it with what's tz? tz of f is t hat e i z psi f. This is t hat sum n goes from 1 to 0 to infinity i z psi and n factorial f. So this is really t hat m psi n applied to f. Uh, oops. i z n n factorial. This already shows that it's an analyt analytic function and you can use it to, to find a derivative. So, so t hat is you can basically what this says is that you can differentiate under the transfer operator. So you can so it's an exercise for you to check it formally that the derivative is what happens when you differentiate under the uh, transfer operator. So it's t hat applied to multiplying by uh, i z psi. So it's t z i psi f, which means that I have i here and m psi, and three in the same way. So i squared is minus one. It's like this or like this. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Similarly, if you differentiate n iterate, then you get i m psi n and this will be minus m psi n squared. So just do the differentiation and justify it. Okay, so now let's differentiate the eigenvalues. We start with the following identity t hat z pz. This is lambda z pz n z pz. n z pz is zero. pz pz is pz because it's a proje projection. So this is lambda z pz. Oops. Now I differentiate this. you get tz prime pz plus tz pz prime is lambda uh, lambda z prime pz plus lambda z pz prime. So now I multiply by pz on the left. pz pz prime pz plus pz, pz, pz prime is lambda z prime, pz prime squared plus lambda z, pz, pz prime. So now let's look at this. pz applied to tz is lambda z pz because tz is lambda, if you multiply this expression from pz on the left, pz kills nz. So you, you remain with lambda z pz. So this is lambda z pz pz prime, which is this. So this is cancelled out. Okay? So we get that, now I substitute z equals zero, I get that p naught, t naught prime is I 
transfer operator MC. not equals lambda not prime p not. Okay? Okay, so now we evaluated the constant function one and we see what happens. Uh, this thing here so we get that lambda not prime p not of one is the integral of one, that's one. equals i integral transfer operator. P naught of 1 is 1. MC of 1 is C. So it's i times the integral of C. So it's 0. So we get that lambda prime is 0. OK? By the way, uh, in uh, Godot's lectures, you heard about uh, equilibrium measures arising as derivatives of pressure. In thermodynamic formalism context, the pressure is it's the exponent or the log? It's the log of the eigenvalue. And exactly, exactly these tricks show you that the derivatives of the pressure give you the integrals with respect to the equilibrium measure. This is exactly how it's done. OK, so this is the first derivative. Let's do the second derivative. It's more or less the same idea, except that it's harder. I mean, it's technically longer, but it's the same. To find lambda no double prime, what we're going to do is we're going to start from this identity, Tz hat n. Tz is lambda z n. Tz. And again, we differentiate it. So uh, Tz hat n prime Tz plus Tz hat n prime Tz prime equals lambda z n prime Tz plus lambda z n Tz prime. We differentiate again. Double prime Tz. Then we have Tz n prime Tz prime, it's the term coming from here. We have exactly the same term coming from here. So we have two. And the remaining term is Tz hat n Tz double prime. And now we do the same for this side. Lambda z n double prime Tz. Lambda z n prime Tz prime. We will get exactly the same term from this expression. So we have a two here. And the remaining term is lambda z n t z double prime. Now we multiply everything on the left. You don't need to write it down because it's all in the notes. Just uh, check that I'm not doing mistakes. So now I'm multiplying everything on the right by p z. z p z. And again, we'll have a cancellation because Pz times Tz is lambda z. Pz times Tzn is lambda z to the power n Pz. So this is lambda z n Pz, Pz double prime, which is exactly this. So this is cancelled out and this is cancelled out. Now, uh, let's investigate what happens here. OK? So lambda z n prime is n lambda z n minus 1 lambda z prime. Uh, if I differentiate it again, I get n n minus 1 lambda z n minus 2 lambda z prime squared plus n lambda z n minus 1 lambda z double prime. 
Now I substitute z equal zero. Lambda z prime at zero is zero. Okay? Lambda z prime at zero is zero. So this dies. Uh, lambda zero is one, so I get that lambda zero, uh, so lambda, the, the derivative at zero of this is n times the second derivative at zero. Okay? So this is good. This term gives me what I want. So I, will get, I will now write what we get at, after substituting z equals zero. And I hope I will not copy it uh, with mistake. T0, here I have T hat N M T N squared T0. I, I use the formula for the second derivative of the operator plus 2P0 uh, again, I have t hat n m c with an i, right? There's an there's an i. T z prime t zero prime some operator equals uh, the second derivative of lambda z, lambda z to the power n at zero is n times second derivative of lambda at zero times P, P zero. And here I have, oh, we didn't calculate this. Here we have the derivative of lambda, the first derivative of lambda at zero is zero, okay? This is zero because this is zero. We calculated before, so the second term that is not there. That's very good because now I can apply these functions, these operators to one. This will give me n times lambda double prime, which is what I want to find. And here we just need to calculate the result. So we'll get that lambda zero prime is one over n integral of t hat n c n squared. This is one. plus 2i integral transfer operator to the power n times c times some function which I don't know what it is, but it's a bounded, it's a function in L. Don't, we don't know what it is, but it's some function. And we have, I'm sorry, it should be. Right, I, I'm, I'm differentiating the nth power, so I have c to n. The int again, the integral of the transfer operator of something is the integral of that something. So this is the integral of, uh, did I get the sign wrong? There's a minus, right? Because I squared, there's an I squared here. I squared. So there's a minus here. Uh, minus psi n squared over n the new, and here we have 2i integral psi n over n times something, we don't know what it is, but it's a function in L. It's a Lipschitz function, bounded Lipschitz function. Now, this is in L, so it's in L1. This is bounded by the norm of, sup norm of psi, and it tends to zero by the ergodic theorem. almost everywhere, by the ergodic theorem. So, because this is bounded, and this is in L1, we have the dominated convergence theorem, this goes to zero. So we get that this is minus integral psi n squared over n plus little o of one. But this is a constant. So it's equal to the limit of this. So what we get out of this business is
consequently, the second derivative of lambda at zero is minus the limit of one over n of these integrals, which is, if you think about it, one over n, the variance of psi n. And this is why this is called the asymptotic variance. So you can see that this is minus sigma squared. We'll see, well, but maybe sigma is zero. We still need to show that this is not zero. Okay? Oops, no, this is no negative. But we still have to show that it's not zero. Okay? So to do this, it's useful to write the asymptotic variance in a different way. It's a there is a very, very famous formula which is called the green Kubo formula. So the exercise is to prove this formula, and basically what you have to do is open the brackets. in cn squared and show that a sigma squared, which is minus lambda naught double prime, is the integral of psi squared plus twice the infinite sum integral psi, psi tn. You have to open the buckets and uh, you measure, you get it. Okay? Now I'm going to use this, uh, how much time do I have? I'm going to use, uh, to use it to show you that uh, sigma is not zero. not clear that sigma is not zero. In fact, if psi is a co-boundary, it will be zero. We, we will have to use the fact that psi is not a co-boundary. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so the trick is that uh, the, the second derivative of, of lambda is minus the asymptotic variance. That's where the minus sign is because of the i square that uh, okay so a uh, proof that c not a boundary implies that sigma is not zero okay so first of all we solve the co-boundary equation. We can always solve the co-boundary equation with p hat, with a transfer operator. Transfer operator is always better than the coupon operator, than the dynamical system. In particular, it, will, it is a co-boundary for the coupon operator. By setting u to be this sum. So if I apply t hat, so first of all, this converges in L. Why does it converge in L? Because t hat n psi, this is p of psi, which is zero, plus n n of psi, which goes to zero exponentially in norm. So this is a perfectly norm convergent sum, because the integral of psi is zero, okay? So this is, this is, I'm not lying here. This sum converges in norm, it's an element of L. So we can all, it is a co-boundary for the transfer operator. But, it, but we are going to show that it's not a co-boundary for T uh, to show that sigma has to be positive. So suppose, by contradiction, that sigma is zero. Then, 
zero is the integral of psi squared plus uh, the integral of two times psi psi tn. But I can write this with a transfer operator, like this. This is psi squared plus two times t hat n psi times psi. Right? I moved the composition with n to this term with a transfer operator. Okay? And now I can rearrange. <laughs> I can. Uh, I can rearrange the formula using this solution. So zero will, is equal to psi is u minus tu. And here, this one goes out. So I have u minus t hat u times uh, oh, I first of all have two. This is a C is, where is it, where is it, where is it? C is u minus tu, and this is tu. Right? This is psi, and this is the sum starting at 1 instead of 0. And this is u minus tu times uh, u, minus t, uh, u minus tu plus uh, uh, twice to you. Okay. So it's u minus t hat u, u plus t hat u. So it's u squared minus t hat u squared. Now I'm going to do something funny. I'm going to write it like this. No harm in this. No harm in that, because T is measure preserving. Now I'm going to do another trick. T, T hat preserves the integral. So this is T hat. Ah, you know what? That's not how I want to do it in a different order. Sorry. So u squared, I want to write like this. Yeah, that's better. This is okay because the integral of u squared is the integral of t hat u squared. So now I'm going. Now I'm going to do this. And there is a reason. What is the reason? The reason is an exercise I, ga exercise I gave you at uh, Ribeiro Preto. And that exercise was an identity for the transfer operator, which holds in complete generality. So it is a fact. that T hat F T is an average operator. It's a conditional expectation of F with respect to T minus 1 B. If you don't know what conditional expectations are, go to the notes. There is an explanation. And now what, what we have here is that the integral of the conditional expectation of U squared T minus B minus the conditional expectation of uh, 
u t minus b squared is zero. Forget about what conditional expectations are in general, precisely, but it is kind of an average, right? What you have here is that the average of the square is the square of the average. Well, let's draw a picture. Here is y equals t square. Suppose you have two points. This is the average. This is the square of the average. And why did I draw the, the two points here? Anyway, this is, the, this is the square of the average. And here is the average of the square. The average of the square is more than the square of the average. This is, an aver this is a function, which is an, at every point it's some kind of an average. And we are telling you that the average of the square is not bigger than the square of the average. It's equal to the square of the aver average. Because of the strict convexity of the parabola, the only way for the square of the average to be equal to the uh, average of the square is if you are averaging a constant function. This is true for averages. For the way that it expresses itself uh, for conditional expectations is so by Jensen's inequality for uh, well, by Jensen's inequality, this thing is always, the, square, the average of the square is always bigger than the square of the average. And there is an equality if and only if you are averaging a constant. When does the conditional expectation average as a constant? When what you are averaging is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra. So if and only if u is equal to the conditional expectation. Okay, so if you are not comfortable with Jensen's inequality for conditional expectations, go to the notes, there is a proof of this. There is a proof of Jensen's inequality for conditional expectations with identification of the case when there is an identity. So see notes for this if, if, you, if you are uncomfortable with this part. But really, it's just the strict convexity of the parabola, which tells you that the only way for the average of the square to equal the square of the average is if you're averaging a constant. OK, so we now know that u, our solution to the co-boundary equation for t hat, is, has this form. But we also know that there is a formula for this. conditional expectation. Again, in terms of the uh, transfer operator. So what we got is that psi I remind you that this was u minus t hat u. This is going to be t hat u t minus t hat t hat u t. There was another exercise I gave you at Riberon, which is that t hat gtf is g t hat f, and therefore this is t hat u t minus t hat u. So we get that it's a co-boundary. Okay? So we started 10 minutes ago with the assumption that sigma equals zero, and we ended with the conclusion that uh, psi must be a co-boundary. But we are assuming that psi is not a co-boundary, so, so sigma can't be, can't be zero. Okay? So that's the proof of the central limit theorem. There are many things you can do with this method. You can go much further than the central limit theorem. You can prove other limit theorem in, in, uh, in probability theory. And they're all done more or less, uh, well, they can all be done using similar uh, methods similar to this one. So thank you very much. Ah, ah.
So if, if instead of using uh, uh, Levy's uh, continuity theorem, you use quantitative versions, such as the berry uh, smoothing inequality, then you can obtain results on the rate of convergence. And the rate of convergence, because of our expansion of the eigenvalue, comes from the O of the T cubed, okay? So O of the T cubed is related to the, to, uh, the third moment of Psi, and uh, it's related to the, the higher derivatives of the pressure. Uh, sorry? Where did I use the, the mini zero? First of all, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's just for convenience because if the mean is not zero, you can just subtract it. Uh, I used it when I, uh, uh, when I showed that the first derivative of the pressure is zero. If the first derivative of the pressure is not zero, then in the Taylor expansion, I have a linear term which I need to 